today. Always a pleasure. And um, I have to say that it's the anniversary of when you started the unit at Mater Dei. Yep. 29th of May 1995 was when we set up the cardiac cardiology unit at Mater Dei. Alex had set up the surgical side in January and I set up the cardiological side in, in May and the lovely thing is that no patients have had to be sent abroad for treatment since then. Because prior to that, over 250 patients a year used to be flown to the UK. And these were patients who either were fit enough to travel, because some of them weren't. And the government would pay for the patients got to go up to the UK, but it wouldn't pay for the families. So families obviously would want to go up with their relative. And quite a few of them had to borrow money, mm. spend at least two weeks in the UK while they're... And I mean, it's uh, so much more comfortable when a family is going through medical problems to be in their own native country, really. Oh. I have to say to our audience, perhaps, uh, I mean, a lot of foreigners watch this programme also, our health service, the success of our health service today, um, you two were pivotal in, uh, in setting it up when many years ago you both came back from living abroad. So I'm really honoured to be sitting here with you both. Um, we're going to have an assessment on COVID today. I know we've done a lot of work together already on COVID-19. Do you think we're, right now, are we seeing the end of the beginning? Are we at a transition stage? Well, um, in the beginning, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a Churchillian statement, so, so we have to be a bit careful. Now, th the reason why I'm here as an obstetrician is because, because my PhD background um, allowed, us, uh, allowed us to make the transition very easily. And we have been having, as you know, a daily webinar with the Department of Pharmacy, looking at the scientific aspect. It's like a scientific think tank. Um, and doing our best. But certainly, certainly, we have to see where we were and what we knew about the disease in January. And, and um, of course, our Department of Health has done an excellent job, and I, I can see the Director of Public Health there and, and the Ministry, in, in preparing us for what we were seeing in Bergamo, for example. In Bergamo, yes. we were seeing an unprepared population in one of the most um, a, 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 one of the most uh, um, sophisticated hospitals in Europe, because the, the, the Bergamo Hospital is one of the most sophisticated hospitals in Europe. It's very well funded, it's very slick, um, it's the industrial area of Italy, and, and yet these people were being overwhelmed. Whatever they tried wasn't working. They had some experience from Wuhan, because Wuhan was, uh, was sharing their information, but this was a disaster. People were fleeing, the hospitals were full, people were on ventilators, gasping, descriptions of people drowning in their secretions. So this was <laughs> horrific, a virus. Yes, that we're not it's been very well, well yes. managed here. But, oh, and but in then, fact the, then, because we were prepared, as we went down south, we realized that, that, that our experience wasn't the same. Now, it was well managed. We had our first uh, cases in March or March the 7th, and, and we went up to, to, to several hundred cases. But if you look at the pathology, it wasn't the same as they had, and as my UK friends had, I trained at King's, and King's had 150 ITU beds fully occupied yes. for a population four times our size. Yes. So, so now that we see our cases, you know, so the, the fat, we call it the fat tail of a Gaussian curve. There's the fat tail, and we find these odd cases. This is still community-based infections. And we're getting yes. the wave, and now we're getting a few aftershocks. And as we open the taps a bit, release our semi-lockdown, slowly, slowly, we evaluate what happens, and really, absolutely. Not much uh, we're joined now by Professor Charmaine Gauci, who is, yes. because of social distancing, mm -hmm. has uh, kindly agreed to join us by Skype. Thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Gauci. Hello. Hello. Thank you for being with us today. We're, we're together with Professor Mark Brinkart mm -hmm. and Professor Albert Fenech. Um, what do you think um, made the management of uh, COVID-19 and the patients so successful here in Malta? First of all, thank you and um, uh, greetings to my fellow colleagues, the professors as well. What happened was that in a way that we were lucky that we weren't hit in the very beginning. So we had a good learning lesson as well for what was happening in China and Wuhan. 
were lucky enough to have direct contacts there. Um, in fact, one of our public health colleagues actually was running the COVID response team in China. So that was very good communication for us. And we were learning as well what was happening in other countries. The main stage of our strategy was that we were actually in containment phase and we were actually testing, identifying the cases, isolating the cases, looking at the people around these cases during the quarantine. So this was a management strategy whereby we were actually testing and testing and testing. In fact, the amount of tests that we have done up to now is one of the highest numbers in Europe per capita. Mm -hmm. And this is really something which needs to be ongoing because um, we can never let go both of the monitoring aspect but also of actually going out there and finding the cases. Mm -hmm. What um, do you reckon that we are in the transition phase now? What, uh, how do you foresee um, this development of, uh, of this pandemic? Yes, we have to realize that the number of cases, if you actually look at the actual figures, you see that they go up and down. So last Friday we had nine cases, then we had one case, then we had a couple of days with no, no cases at all. And what we're seeing is actually is the most important thing is the actual number of positive tests out of the testing. So if you really look at the graph, which looks at the percentage of positive tests, you see um, a peak around April and then a smaller peak a bit later on. But then we're seeing these sort of like ripples um, of positive tests out of the total of number of tests that we have done. So really the biggest wave is over for us. However, we are still going on with these small numbers. One important thing to note is that even in our testing strategy, we have moved on. We started in the beginning with looking at cases which were travel related. So our case definition for testing was all those people who were symptomatic and have traveled abroad. But as we started with the community transmission, then we started seeing the contacts of the cases of those who traveled abroad. And then we started seeing community cases which were community transmission. We then even moved on with our testing strategy, whereby we looked at people who were actually asymptomatic. So now we are getting a number of people out of our positive tests of people who actually don't have any symptoms at all. These are important to be picked up because we really want to identify all the cases. So if you really want to see what is really going on and comparing to other countries, you have to compare like with like. And it is quite clear that right now we are in the phase of transition whereby we are looking at um, the peak has slowly gone down. But we are now looking at that stage whereby we're still having minimal cases. And yet we are going through the transition phase of lifting certain measures that we had already taken so that we continue to monitor as we lift these measures. And as things keep on going stable, then we can go on through our transition strategy and continue to lift more measures. Thank you very much, Professor Gauci. Thank you for your contribution tonight. And I wish you a very good weekend. Thank you and well Thank done. You. She deserves uh, a Absolutely. lot of praise, yeah. a lot uh, of praise. Now, I'd like to ask you, Professor Fenech, uh, it was announced today uh, that the health director in Norway said that widespread testing has no purpose and the lockdowns were all unnecessary. What do you think of that? Um, it's amazing how many conflicting views you have on yes. that. I must say, I tend to stick with what the WHO say rather than what individuals say. <laughs> We've had uh, uh, individuals coming out saying that it's going to fizzle out in the next six weeks, which also seems highly unlikely. So I, I would stick with the WHO rather yes. than these uh, individual Yes, every country seems to have its own... Uh... But it's amazing that the Norwegians would say this, out of all people, when he's got Sweden next door, which has operated as a semi-open policy, with four or five times the debts that they've had in Norway. Yes. So, so I'm, amazed, I'm amazed that he'd say something like that. And, and the percentage uh, point that uh, that uh, Mr. <laughs> said is, is very important because there was a time in the UK when 25% of tested cases were positive, where we, when we were, we were having 1% only. So this immediately raised the alarm bells and, and, and t to me suggested, uh, this was in the Sunday Times a few days later, by the way, so it was just me, that they weren't doing enough testing. 
they weren't doing enough testing because you had to be really symptomatic at the hospital to be uh, to be to be tested. And yet, I have friends of mine, personal friends of mine, who almost certainly had COVID, who were never tested, who were never allowed to be tested. They were never offered the test. So as as the, the amount of testing went up in the UK, then the percentage of positive cases came down. But still, they did not have the amount of testing we had. And how did we know we had asymptomatic cases here? It was very, the story is very interesting because we had pointed out to, to Professor Gauchi as well. Uh, there was a time when patients being admitted for procedures to Mother Day were being tested. So we had pa women, pregnant women, who were being admitted for inductions of cesarean sections who were being tested. These were completely asymptomatic women and were found to be COVID positive. So it was quite clear that here we had a population of asymptomatic carriers, we call them. And the interesting thing is that when their babies were born, their babies were not positive, they were negative. They could breastfeed and, and this is when we had to have some hard decisions, but as we evolved then we could once again relax a bit yes. um, with husbands not attending and so on. Yes. But uh, you know, if you look at the sciences now you have to say, okay, we've had a plague, but normally after a plague you get a famine. What do you think, uh, <laughs> Professor Fenech, that each country seems to adopt a different strategy? Also, the results of certain countries are very surprising. I was surprised at, say, South Africa, where there's lots of townships and there's absolutely no social distancing whatsoever, and yet they've got very low cases. The, what, what's been amazing, too, is that I mean, since December, we've been learning new things virtually on a daily basis about how this virus behaves. Um, and I know we know more about it, but I'm sure we don't know the full story yet. Yes. And also, the use of ventilators has now been put into question, whether they, in fact, do anything. We now know that the virus attacks virtually every single organ in the body, uh, not just the lungs, as was originally thought. We now know that uh, part of the problems it causes uh, a lot of thrombosis inside the body, so we're giving people aspirin and anticoagulants as part of a standard protocol. So we're learning um, as, it, as we go along. And coming back to you, children are still less affected mm -hmm. than yes. adults. Uh, this thrombosis <coughs> issue is very important because we got this information from the biochemistry that Wuhan had and early on because Bergamo decided to do a lot of post-mortems. Now the Brompton in the UK has done its CT scans and it shows that it's a vascular problem as well. And this is why ventilators might not be so useful. Very similar to what we see in what we call preeclampsia and obstetrics. Um, and I know I keep on going to obstetrics, but obstetrics is a very vast subject. And, 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 and by attacking with anticoagulants, as, as Albert said here, we are probably getting better results than simply ventilating these patients. Now, when it comes to children, children constitute about 5% of all cases, uh, a small but very important percentage. Um, they do seem to have some immunity uh, derived from the mothers, but the placentas are full of virus. The placentas are infected in most cases. Um, and and as, as Professor Fennec said, even in us, we have our organs are affected. You know, to, yesterday, I was reading an article that indicated that the brain was affected by the virus. There's virus found in the brain as well. So the smell and taste business is quite important, really, not, a, not a something to be you know, treated with. with you know. um, but children, children, there's a small percentage of children who get this Kawasaki syndrome. And that yes, is yeah. a vascular problem. It's a vascular problem. So it's an overreaction, an overreaction, if you like, it's an immune overreaction. And they do get, um, you know, um, uh, um, thrombosis in the legs. They do get um, some digital necrosis in the toes. And, and it's important to realize that this is possible because you can treat them appropriately early and get away with it. Uh, We're going for a short commercial break and I'll be back with you very soon with my guests here and some more. Stay with us. Somebody.